بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ان آر لاسٹ لیکچر وی لکڈ ایٹ ہاؤ دی لنگوسٹک اسٹائلسٹکس اینڈ لٹری اسٹائلسٹکس بوتھ آبزرو دی نوشن آف اسٹائل اینڈ دی ایلیمنٹ آف اسٹائل اینڈ لٹری ورکس فرام اے ڈفرینٹ پرسپیکٹو فرسٹلی دی لنگوسٹک اسٹائلسٹکس وچ فوکسز آن دی لینگویج آف لٹری ٹیکسٹس فرام دا پوائنٹ آف ویو آف اے لنگوسٹ فار دی لنگوسٹک اسٹائلسٹکس دی لینگویج از امپورٹنٹ ان دیٹ اٹ reveals the elements of language which function in a literary text for the sake of communicating a particular message. On the other hand, the literary stylistics focuses on messages. The purpose of literary stylistics is to look at the messages encoded in a text, rather to look at the different aspects of language which are the concern of a linguist. So in this respect, The linguistic stylistics and literary stylistics both have different perspectives to observe text. The perspective of a literary stylistician is that of a literary critic, whereas the perspective of a linguistic stylistics is that of a linguist. But we do not study these two kinds or forms of stylistics as separate because they could not uh, have uh, a single or a unified whole way of looking at a text. We look at these two perspectives separately in order to understand that how the linguistic stylistics would serve as a way to enter into the world of a text so that the literary analysis or the analysis of a literary critic could be applied upon a text. So these two branches of linguistics or the subfields of linguistics do not set apart or do not exist separately from each other. They both work simultaneously because a stylistician's job is to observe the language of a text and reach to its messages. And the linguistic stylistics helps in analyzing vigorously, scientifically and in detail the language of a text. And then the literary critic or a literary stylistician would take up the job of interpreting the messages encoded in those words and the functions that the words perform within a text. So that is the reason that we look at literary stylistics and linguistic stylistics as two separate modes, as two separate perspectives, which both, if united, could lead to such a method, could lead to such a technique that is called stylistics, which would enable us for a rigorous and in-depth understanding of literary texts. And this understanding of literary texts could later be applied to any form of discourse, knowledge or expression of human thought. You can see that the linguistic uh, stylistics uses uh, the approach to, of the linguists to study the devices of language, to study the elements of language such as the rhetorical figures in language or the syntactical patterns of language which are employed to express a particular meaning and which is expressed to connote or reveal a specific literary style. On the other hand, the literary stylistics or the orientation of a literary critic can be seen as uh, synonymous to literary criticism because this analysis is a bit subjective and uh, it takes into account the perspective of a literary critic who relies solely on the interpretation of the texts to decipher the messages of the writers, which are the individual uh, writers' own personal point of view. It cannot be applied to uh, the world as an objective analysis of any idea, thought or experience. So linguistic stylistics and literary stylistics, though they both start their uh, initial uh, work from a different uh, stance, from a different angle. But since it is the observation on language, it is the investigation of language, they both merge in order to uh, vigorously analyze the language and to reach to the interpretation and explanation of the texts. Uh, in the last lecture, we also looked in detail at uh, the features which are uh, employed by the writers to enhance their text, to enhance the expression. Now, these features uh, are the features which are of a great focus for uh, a linguistic uh, stylistician because he wants to observe 
the elements of language being used these elements of language or features of language are to be identified classified and then commented upon by the linguistic stylistician as Widowson has explained that stylistic analysis refers to the identification of the patterns of language now these patterns of language are uh, like phonology grammar rhetorical uh, devices syntactical devices morphological makeup of a text and uh, the analysis of these elements is necessary for the understanding of a literary text the first level of analysis that we uh, looked at in the last lecture also was uh, the uh, phonological level which we will uh, recap a little to uh, understand what we did in the last uh, class also the phonological level of uh, the language deals with the system of sounds the combination of sounds to uh, generate a speech or writing through phonology we uh, are able to utter uh, the uh, expression or uh, the superficial le level of the language is understood and the aspects of phonology like uh, morphemes and uh, phonemes or the uh, sound patterns in the form of alliteration consonants assonance they all serve to give an effect to the language for example in a poem they are related to create a mood they are created to uh, uh, they are related to create uh, a tone or a particular rhythm melody and rhyme in a poem that could be uh, connoting towards the harshness or could be connoting towards the melody the soothing and the comforting melodies which the poet has uh, created so the phonological level of language comes under focus of a linguistic stylistician for example uh, we observe this example uh, from de silva's songs of odembo in the lines uh, their stanzas of stifling scandal cause the masses to curse in this line we notice alliteration of uh, sir sound and also in the second line also there is uh, alliteration on the word cause and curse now look at how the alliteration or the repetition of the consonant sounds that is creating the alliteration is adding to the theme of the poem that uh, the purpose of the poet to refer to the corruption and uh, the evil inherent within the system of uh, governance and politics in Nigeria has been exploited the writer gives vent to his feelings of frustration through such words which uh, correspond with each other and uh, which resonate with the hissing sound of the uh, sibilance that is sir sound the second level that we observed uh, was the graphological level graphological as uh, the word graphological encompasses within it the word graph that refers to the appearance of a text how a text uh, is constructed as uh, a picture or as a, or as a graph which is uh, a visual or a visible thing now to create the visual aspect of language in the language of poems or literary writings for example writers also experiment with the graphology of uh, the words for example they may prefer to stick to capitalization to a uh, more greater an extent they may choose to ignore uh, the aspect or the principle of capitalization in their poems also they may adhere to the use of uh, punctuation and uh, other mechanics of writing or they may ignore the mechanics of writing to make their writing seem odd strange unusual distinct and uh, extraordinary there are a number of poets and writers in the uh, literature of uh, english who are known for their experimentation and uh, their novel use of uh, the graphological aspects of the english language for example emily dickinson's use of capitalization she sticks to capitalization not in the regular way but she invents her own way of capitalizing those words which may otherwise be not capitalized similarly she uh, uses an over emphasis uh, on the use of punctuation commas dashes and ellipses these marks of punctuation or dashes are not used just for the sake of uh, the appearance they are used 
only uh, not only to enhance the appearance of the text and make it appear uh, strange odd and familiar to the reader but also the pauses and dashes for example in dickinson's poetry add further to the meaning of the poet as for example if a dash occurs after uh, a phrase or a line for example success is counted sweetest and dash and then by those who never succeed now the dash within the two uh, parts of the sentence connotes the poet's uh, ability to capture through words the uh, mechanism of uh, thinking that how the time mind takes in order to perceive things or think over the ideas could also be rendered through words the pauses do not her uh, reluctance her uh, uh, ability to judge things or to think over the ideas that would uh, refer to as a pause in speech so just the way we take pauses in speech uh, to denote uh, that we are uh, coming up with the answer or that we are thinking about what to say next similarly in writing the dashes and uh, the uh, hyphens denote the poet or the persona's ability to render the same feeling that occurs in spontaneous thought and uh, speech in the uh, writing as well or specifically in the poetic creation as well we also discussed that how unlike dickinson e e cummings uh, violates uh, the grammatical or the rules of punctuation for not uh, giving any uh, heed to punctuation marks he does not capitalize any letter in his poems the poem would begin with uh, these uh, lower case letters and uh, he would not make use of punctuation which would not only add to ambiguity because without punctuation we are unable to decide where uh, a sentence or a thought would end and how it would begin to merge with something that would follow it so e e cummings with his uh, neglect of the punctuation marks and the mechanics of writing adds to the complexity ambiguity strangeness of his works of his poems and then the reader's job becomes more tough as he has to decipher not only the meanings of words but he has also to decipher the form of a statement or the form of a poem so these were the two aspects that we looked at in the last lecture also that how the linguistic features uh, the feature of phonology and the feature of uh, graphology are parts of language are parts of uh, the uh, language which is a linguist's concern for the sake of arriving at the meanings of the text for the sake of analyzing the text as a critic or as a literary stylistician or even as a linguistic stylistician now we will look at the uh, other aspects or the remaining aspects of uh, the language which uh, are of concern uh, for the literary artist because he has created them deliberately he has employed them deliberately in his writing and also he, it is important to analyze those uh, linguistic features as they exemplify a language system that how language of the communication of literary texts operates on certain principles how the uh, emphasis on one aspect would add to the overall beauty of the text the third level that we will observe today as part of the study of the linguistic stylistics is the level or the feature that is referred to as lexis lexical level of the words or the language of poems or literary works or the lexicology as lexis is the uh, total number of words that uh, word forms that can be created out of the root words words in a poem or in a stanza may be of great importance because a writer chooses from among uh, a great uh, sea or web of words some particular words which he considers most appropriate and pertinent for the expression of the thought so the relationship between thought and expression is determined by the choice of the words on part of the poet so words may be repeated within a text a writer may again and again use the same words in order to uh, bring the idea more closer to the reader 
and the repetition of words or the lexical terms or uh, the lexis would add to the memorability as well. As we notice in the phonological uh, patterning that writers make use of repetitive sounds. Here in lexical level, writers make use of the same words. For example, a writer may use uh, synonyms. He may also use uh, the uh, anaphora or the repetition of words through the use of pronouns or he may use similar words like uh, near synonyms or uh, the use of hyponymy. Now, hyponymy and anaphora are important as uh, they might be the terms which not each and every one of us might be familiar with. For example, look at hyponymy. Hyponyma, hyponymy is the uh, words belonging to a particular category on the same level or from the same category. For example, if a word is used by writer, that is the word vegetation, he may use the words related to the idea of vegetation, which might reveal uh, the uh, connections between vegetation and the other objects. And the objects should belong to the same category, that is either grass, leaves, flowers, or maybe name of a particular uh, tree like uh, birches, or the name of a particular flower like daffodils. So, hyponymy can create a group or a cluster of words. This cluster of words belong to a single category. Then it is the writer's choice of lexis that from among uh, the lexis, which words does he choose to reveal an idea? For example, there are many objects that may uh, be similar to the idea of vegetation that may explain the idea of vegetation or belong to the cluster of vegetation. But here the writer, instead of choosing any other name for a flower, for example, sticks to the word daffodils. And then from among uh, the vegetation of uh, other uh, species in plants, he chooses the word grass. Then uh, to refer to some other things, he chooses uh, the word uh, birches to refer to a tree. Now, these lexical choices are not random. These lexical choices are not arbitrary. They are part of the complex system which governs the use of language and how one form of a word, how one lexis is preferred over another is to be observed by the uh, linguistic stylistician because a linguistic stylistician would like to observe which groups and categories the words, the lexis belong to. Then there can be verbal repetitions in the form of anaphora. Anaphora is the uh, reference to the words which may uh, have occurred earlier as well. For example, in the title of the poem, the writer uses uh, the name of a person. For example, in Eliot's uh, poem, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Prufrock's name has been used in the title. And within the poem, if the poet makes use of the pronoun he or Prufrock, it is referred to as anaphora because the writer is referring back to something that has been mentioned earlier. And in order to avoid the repetition of the whole name, that is J. Alfred Prufrock, he refers to him only as Prufrock or he refers to him with the pronoun he. So these repetitions add to coherence, cohesion, unity, diversity, yet the uh, beauty of a text is kept in act. If the name is repeated again and again, if same categories of words appear again and again, the reader would feel uh, bored. He would uh, not enjoy the text as something unique, unusual and strange. So to show the idea that uh, a writer has uh, a whole wealth of words in front of him from where he can make choices and from among the available word he could only make use of those words which are most suitable and then how they would relate to the theme would be the next step to observe in the understanding of a literary text from a stylistician's perspective. Now look at this example of uh, the lexical level 
that is of uh, great uh, concern for a uh, linguistic statistician. This example has been taken from S.T. Coleridge's poem, Rhyme of an Ancient Mariner. In Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, Coleridge states uh, that, I looked upon the rotting sea, and there the dead men lay. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. Now to bring the idea of death and uh, clamor to the audience, the writer has repeated the word, I looked upon the rotting, and then the word C has been replaced in the third line with the word deck in order to refer to the fact that wherever the persona looked, he observed the same thing. He observed the same phenomena that was death, whether it was the sea that stretched far or whether it was uh, the ship, the deck of the ship, which lies near to the persona. There only one thing could be found that was death. There lay dead men and the second line and there the dead men lay has been repeated as in the last line too and there the dead men lay. Now lexical level or the repetition of the words at lexical level also connotes the importance of the writer's choices for the sake of uh, choosing the features of language why uh, the writer has made use of the similar lexis, the similar words like I looked upon the rotting and then I looked upon the rotting deck. Now, he repeats the same in the second line and the third line too, which begin with the same uh, phrase that is, and there the dead men lay, and there the dead men lay. Now, this repetition for a linguistic stylistation becomes uh, significant and worth uh, noticing because he uh, identifies it as uh, an unusual thing because the repetition brings to mind the idea that there must be some mechanism, there must be uh, some principle governing the writer's thought which has led him to repeat these lines. On, and now as uh, a stylistician, we observe that repetition mostly is done for the sake of letting the reader understand the importance of an idea because if we do not repeat things in poetry or in literary writings the readers may overlook those notions and overlooking those notions they may not uh, understand the importance of something that the writer present for example over here the idea of death the theme of death which has been uh, enhanced and which has been brought closer to the reader through the idea of repetition that is the lexical repetition. Now look at the fourth level that is of uh, importance for a linguistic stylistation that is the syntactical level. The syntactical level of uh, the writings which is concerned with the arrangement of words in a sentence. It is uh, important to understand how significant syntax is for the purpose of conveying meaning because any inversion or change in the arrangement of words in a sentence would not let us convey the meaning that we wish to convey to the reader. Similarly, the change in syntax order or the placement of words and phrases within a sentence also changes the emphasis of a sentence. The syntactical level is concerned with the arrangement of words in a sentence and it also attempts to describe these elements, how they function in the sentence. It also studies the description of rules of the positioning of the words in a sentence. For example, we observe the rule of a syntax in the form of subject, verb and object. And then this rule is uh, changed when we form passive voices from active voices. It also involves rules of positioning of elements in a sentence such as nouns, verbs, adverbs. So we see that how the placement of words and uh, the particular elements of uh, grammar is also determined due to the, the uh, system of uh, syntax that is there in grammar. For example, the verbs add to define 
the adverbs add to define further about the verbs. For example, the placement of a verb like walking briskly or briskly walking would convey a different sense, would convey a different meaning. So the placement of the words in a sentence is important for emphasis, is important for conveying meaning and it is important only for the sake of effect it would have on the reader. Either humorous effect or the effect of uh, a poetic composition or the effect of a prose composition is what would be conveyed through the positioning of words in a sentence or through the use of syntactical order. Look at this example of uh, syntactical uh, deviation or syntactical violation. The example states, home he went. Now you do not come across such a statement, rather you would say he went home. So instead of saying he went home, this sentence in words the proper syntactical order and puts the word home initially in the sentence in order to lay emphasis on the word home rather than on uh, emphasis laying emphasis on he had it been the regular sentence he went home it would have given stress to the person now instead of giving stress or significance to the person the inversion of syntax into home he went is giving importance to the word home or the notion home. So this is how the meaning of the words is changed or the meanings of sentence is changed by the placement of words in a particular way that is dealing with the syntactical level of the statements. Look at the second example that states something there is that doesn't love a wall. This is the first line of uh, Robert Frost's poem, Mending Wall. In Mending Wall, Robert Frost begins the poem by saying, something there is that doesn't love a wall. Instead of saying, there is something that does not love a wall. Now the regular expression that we use would have been, there is something that doesn't love a wall. But why the writer has violated that syntactical order and created his own syntactical formation that is beginning with word something. Now observing this statement we see that when placed in the beginning of the sentence or when used as the very first word of the poem the word something is associated with a lot of meaning and with a lot of importance because if you have read uh, Robert Frost's poem Mending Wall you uh, will be able to understand that the word something gives importance to the mystery or the creepy or the airy feeling that something beyond the comprehension of the speaker or the persona lies there in the world in the neighborhood in the environment that does not let the walls stay inact. So since the whole poem deals with the idea that he cannot figure out what it is in the neighborhood that breaks the wall. So by placing the word something he gives importance to the idea of mystery, the presence of some elf-like thing or something supernatural that does not let the wall stay inact between two neighbors houses. So there is a design in a poet's mind. Had he created uh, the usual expression in the way there is something that doesn't love a wall, he wouldn't have been able to give this expression or this impression to the reader about the significance of some unknown thing, some presence that is undecipherable or unimaginable that is against the division between two neighbors. So look how uh, beautifully the uh, tactful uh, use of syntax could add to the meaning in the literary writings, could even give food for thought to the reader, that the reader wouldn't have imagined that these clues, these uh, notions inherent in the language of a text would be so informative that the grammatical construction of a sentence also corresponds with the meanings that the writer intends to convey to the reader. So it would be a linguistic stylistation or uh, 
a linguist who is paying close attention to the language of text for example in this case to the syntax of the text that how the syntax of a text is created by design by uh, great care by the author and it is not just the mere following of rules but at times the breaking of rules that is meaningful that makes the text important and it makes it stand out from the rest of the creations which would have been created on the more regular pattern now let us observe the next level that is the semantic level now the job of a linguistic stylistic is that keeping in mind the linguistic stylistics or its operations its principles its methodology the linguist is supposed to take care of what are the dimensions of the language use what are the features and elements of language use that add to the uh, construction that uh, lead to the construction of meaning so meaning is what is the ultimate uh, job of uh, a critic to decipher of course it is the understanding of the meanings of the text for which we are exploring the language for which we are identifying and tearing apart many aspects and features of language if we do not one by one look at each feature in detail we may not be able to reach to the closest possible meanings which lie within the text and which had been there when the writer created those texts or which would be the meanings which the readers would add to the text when they would interact or uh, interact with the text or read the text so semantic level deals with the meanings inherent in the words statements sentences and in the literary texts which function as discourses as a whole because observe that the meaning of a word in isolation might be different then what meaning that same word would connote or refer to when it is used in a particular context when it is employed in a particular situation for instance observe my using the word smart if you open up the dictionary you would notice that the smart refers to somebody who is intelligent or smart refers to somebody who is looking uh, gorgeous in appearance but in a classroom if i call one of my students that don't try to be smart now here the word smart is not used in that context because i am looking at this word with the inherent connotation of uh, insult because smart here in the use might connote that there occurs the uh, association of the word uh, clever with the word so the meaning of a word smart which was positive has been turned into negative when it is used in a particular context or situation or it may also be used as a taunt so the semantic level of the word or the understanding of words in the linguistic stylistics makes us realize or makes a linguist or a critic realize that semantics would engage a critic in the exploration of the multiple possible meanings of a text not just the denotative meaning denotative meaning the dictionary meaning but also the contextual or the connotative meaning as well so the whole domain of meaning the whole territory of meaning cannot be confined just to their dictionary meanings just to the dictionary meaning of words so semantics deals with the level of meaning in language for example how words similar or different are related so another aspect that uh, semantics also deals with is that how words form a relationship with the adjoining words or with the other connected words within the sentence or the whole para or stanza or the text it also tries to give account of both word and sentence meaning now it introduces us to another dimension of meanings or semantics that the meaning of a word if looked into isolation would be different but when the same word is used in different sentences due to the need of the speaker 
he or she would connote through it the different meanings though the word would be same but its use would identify it with different meanings now let us observe the examples of uh, some uh, semantic uh, level or the use of the words in different connotations in a sentence for example if we look at this statement that states that the writer has penned down his ideas with extreme brevity pick up the word pen and take it in isolation and you would see that pen is an object it's a noun but here it is used as a verb the writer is not saying that the writer used the pen to write his ideas rather here it is said the writer has penned down his ideas now the word pen has been used as uh, not not as a noun but as a verb which is referring to another meaning or another possibility of the use of the word pen similarly in the next example that has been taken from uh, shakespeare's work antony and cleopatra the speaker states i see squeaking cleopatra boy my greatness now the important word from the point of view of semantic analysis or from the point of view of linguistic analysis is the word boy just like in the previous example the word pen had been used not as a noun but as a verb here too the word boy has been used not as a noun but as a verb so this is unusual this is strange and something that the reader is unfamiliar with now such instances may not be found in speech very often but literary writings abound with such instances because it is the merit of the literary writing that it has to create in itself something unusual something strange new and novel so these two instances where the semantic meaning connotes that the word means a particular thing whereas the sentence meaning or the sentence use of a word denotes that it has been used in a different way and it has to function in a different mode so this is how the semantics of the uh, language or the formation of the words and their use in a sentence in a situation in a text would define to a linguistic stylistician that words do not only mean what they mean in isolation what they mean in a uh, separate uh, you know identity when their identity is uh, created within a context within a sentence they mean many things they multiply their meaning they diversify their meaning and they even challenge our understanding of the meanings of those words which we might have looked at in different meanings or contexts only the next level that uh, a linguistic stylistician is concerned about in his study of the literary texts is the morphological level in the study of the morphology or in the subject of morphology we study the grammatical units of language their formation into words and uh, it also studies how the words are formed for example what are their grammatical forms and how many uh, systems uh, into gender number or plural they can be changed into then how the words which are changed from positive to negative could also be formed through the changes in morphological makeup of a word and the examples of uh, morphological level or the morphological construction can be seen in poetry very often because in the construction of poetry the writers often experiment with words they do not like to stick to, to those forms of words which are prevalent or are in use even the writers might create uh, unusual and strange ways in which they create words or even coin words or blend words for instance in the language there are rules that certain words cannot be uh, used with the word un for example if there is a word logical you cannot say unlogical rather the uh, language prescribes for it uh, turning it into negative as illogical 
so if we make use of such words in poetry due to poetic license this would be an unusual formation of a word which would be uh, a diversity or a change or a modification of the morphological principles observe these examples and uh, this example again is from the famous american poet e e cummings poems e e cummings in his uh, poem makes use uh, that is quite unusual a use of the prefix un for example he attaches the word uh, with the word love uh, the uh, prefix un and makes the use or invents another word coins another word that is unlove stating unloves the heavenless hell now instead of saying hate he has turned the word love into negative which does not exist in the english language but his unusual use of uh, uh, the word that is using a prefix un with the word love makes us stop and think and reflect over this abnormality over this curious uh, and strange use of language in the uh, poetry of e e cummings we repeatedly come across such unusual constructions of words which the morphological principles of language do not allow for example apart from the word unlove he also coined the word uh, within a poem unhate and also uh, a very unusual word man unkind now the word mankind exists but to satirize or to criticize the humanity he has coined the word man unkind by blending of two words man and kind then another example from the same poet's poem is darkness eats a distance of bird fully darkness eats a distance bird fully now darkness is associated with the bird who is eating it bird fully now we do not find that in english it should have been like darkness eats a distance like a bird or the like a bird eats its prey but the word bird fully seems unusual interesting and strange as a bird has been given a monstrous connotation which is uh, you know eating something that the darkness has now been personified as a bird which just like a bird eats its prey darkness is eating the world and the distance that lies between the light and darkness so here the word birdfully has been utilized instead of saying like a bird so these are the instances of the morphological deviations or the morphological unusualness that may exist in literary texts that would be the focus of analysis of a linguistic stylistician a linguistic stylistician focuses on the unusual compositions that may occur in a language and the language of poetry abounds with such instances in the language of poetry we find the unusual construction of words unusual blends of words unusual coinage of words like uh, neologism as well that is the uh, word coined by a poet or a writer himself under poetic license which may not be uh, a regular word which may not be a correct word but within the context of a literary writing that word stands to denote something to connote something for instance another example of uh, morphological level that could be observed by a linguistic stylistician can be uh, from uh, james joyce's uh, novel ulysses in ulysses james joyce has made use of words like uh, musy room or uh, even uh, unfathering now musy room is no word either it's uh, museum or music room but musy room is a coinage it's a neologism similarly the word unfathering unfathering is incorrect as far as the morphological principles of construction are concerned but within the context of the novel within the context of the literary piece the word unfathering connotes something maybe it refers to 
the uh, death of uh, a father maybe it refers to the murder of a father or maybe it refers to the murder of a child that would be in the uh, an act of unfathering so look how the unusual strange or apparently incorrect looking uh, expressions in morphology in word construction too have a meaning they too have a significance that is there is a madness involved in the poet's construction but we allow the poet to take the poetic license because in that madness that has resulted in the unusual construction of words in the uh, writing would account for quite a meaning quite a sane and uh, just and wise interpretation of a text so that is how the poetic license would allow the uh, the writers the poets uh, specifically to uh, experiment with language and the morphology of a word now comes the uh, discourse level that is a more broader level as compared to previous six levels that were in observation for example phonological level lexical level or semantic level they dealt with specific uh, uh, features of text for example the phonological dev level dealt only with the sounds either sounds of uh, in individual words or the sounds in the form of rhyme at the ending of a poem the semantic level dealt with the individual meanings of words as well as their meaning in the context of a sentence now the discourse level deals with the uh, construction of uh, the text as a whole which is of course the composition of a language use and grammar but it also deals with the links between sentences that are referred to as intersentential links the intersentential links or the links between the sentences form a connective text or a cohesive text connective or cohesive text means that it is uh, the dependence upon grammar phonology syntax graphology and all the rest of elements which when combined and used in a proper order would make writing a discourse it would have uh, relevance it would have connection with what is said earlier and what would be said later so the discourse level deals with the relationship between sentences and statements within a text observe a poem for example that how the opening the middle and the ending of a poem are connected either through repetition of certain words statements and ideas or through the logical development of a thought which would not make us feel that there is some information missing every information or piece of information is placed in a particular order in this place in a particular place and then the use of certain cohesive devices like the use of uh, pronouns would also for example serve for the sake of creating cohesive text for example the use of connectives connectives like uh, words uh, such as as but and also and these are the words which uh, let a writer avoid repeating words or which also make a writer avoid create very long or separate sentences with the use of but and also though he even is able to connect two sentences so that they do not sound separate or they do not seem disjointed and this is done in order to uh, make the speech cohesive make the writing cohesive if the writing is disjointed and there is no cohesion the meaning or the reception of meaning of a text would be affected we also notice in the uh, discourse level uh, analysis or the discourse level uh, that is to be observed by the linguistic stylistician the use of repetitions repetition might occur at the level of nouns that is the most simple way of repetition repetition of words in the form of synonyms or words belonging to the similar categories then uh, using the definite articles 
So in this way, the discourse level analysis by a linguistic stylistician would help identify those elements which function to make a text cohesive, organized and a connected speech or writing which would be as a whole meaningful expression where meaning of each word, each statement does not only uh, lie in its isolation or in its separate identity but the meaning could be judged by its relationship with what is to follow and what has happened earlier in the text. So text, poetry or any literary piece functions as a discourse for a literary stylistician as well as for a linguistic stylistician because both the job of linguist and the job of uh, a literary critic is to identify the meanings which are underlying a text because it is a discourse. Observe this uh, example that is the uh, discourse level example of uh, the use of language or the features of language and uh, the elements of language. When I consider how my light is spent or half my days in this dark world and wide and that one talent which is death to hide lodged with me useless through my soul more bent. In this example that is from Milton's uh, sonnet we see the beginning that he starts with the word when and connects the thoughts in the first two lines by using the word and in the second line. So the, the use of these words is uh, added or employed to function as cohesive devices. When I consider how my light is spent and that one talent which is death to hide has formed a connection of the next thought with the previous one. The first statement of the poem gives the thought that the poet is regretting over the loss of years, loss of life that are spent in darkness. And then he is saying that there is a connection between the life that he has spent and the one talent that is his writing would be denied, would be lost when he would die. So the connection of these statements is done through the help of the cohesive devices like the use of the word and and the use of the word when. So a linguistic uh, stylistician would identify the cohesive devices, he would mark them, specify them and then look at how they function within the text. What functions do they perform in isolation, in language or in grammar or in linguistics and then how within a text these words function to convey the meaning that would of course be the writer's logical way to present an argument and when a writer is presenting an argument in a logical way he has to justify, he has to convince the reader and it is through these cohesive devices, the connectives that the speech or expression is given more force and uh, connection with the thought of the writer. Now these are the features which in linguistic stylistics we focus our attention on. For example, the aspect of phonology, the aspect of uh, graphology, lexis, syntax, semantics, morphology and discourse. Now these are some of the features which uh, we have allowed to uh, the a literary stylistician or the linguistic stylisticians to focus on because they are supposed to form uh, the stylistic analysis of text and the stylistic analysis of text would focus on the language of a text, the grammar of a text and the various levels which we looked at today in the form of phonology, in the form of graphology, lexis, syntax, semantics, morphology and discourse. These levels are of great uh, interest as well as concern for a literary stylistician as well as for a linguistic stylistician. Why they are both linked? Because a linguistic stylistician would identify these elements, classify these elements, observe how many of these elements uh, occur or reoccur in a text. And then from there onwards, the literary stylistician would take the analysis that how these 
elements or features add to the meaning of a text. Their function would be doubled. Not only it is the creation of uh, a novel or distinct text, but also it is the creation of a novel and distinct meaning as well, which is inherent in the text. Now that we have looked at uh, in detail at the various features which a linguistic stylistician focuses on when he is observing literature as a text, when he is observing a piece of writing from a linguist's point of view. These features would denote the significance of language for literature. As in our discussion in the previous lectures too, I tried to uh, tell you that how the subject of stylistics bridges the gap between linguistics and literature, linguistics and literary criticism. Because now that the 20th and the 21st century have brought a number of developments in the linguistics or the field of linguistics, the linguistic analysts too are taking interest within the domain of literature. Now, previously the linguists were concerned only to observe the language use that is taking place uh, in the conversations or in the society. The purpose of the linguistic theorists in the beginning had been to analyze only the language of use or the language of speech that is there in the ordinary uh, speech or expression. The spoken expression of the people had been the focus of linguists. But now, gradually, in the 20th century and the 21st century, we see a great shift that the linguists are focusing their attention on the literary texts, that how the theories develop in linguistics, the elements that a linguist studies in the language of speech and uh, expression could also be applied to the study of literature. Because previously for the criticism, interpretation and, analyze, and uh, analysis of literature, only literary criticism could be accounted for. Now, if literary criticism only looks at the messages, themes and ideas of a text, lit, uh, the linguistic theories help in understanding the language of text. Now if both are combined, the linguistic stylistics and literary stylistics, linguistic stylistics whose focus is the language, the elements of language like graphology, phonology, semantics, syntax and literary stylistics which observe the messages themes, ideas, more focus on the writer's perspective. If both the approaches work harmoniously, work simultaneously together, it would be stylistics. It would be a stylistic analysis, a more detailed, holistic and vigorous analysis of texts. To uh, understand the ideas learned today for uh, the study of linguistic stylistics. In the uh, end of today's lecture, we will observe one roadside sign. That would be an inter interesting example, an interesting study for the sake of stylistic analysis, employing the linguistic stylistics. Look at this uh, statement. That is a roadside sign, of course, for the sake of uh, the uh, drivers, so that they uh, carry or they observe precaution while driving, it is written that no left turn. The roadside sign says no left turn. Now observe this single statement, no left turn, which is very much a short statement, just three words. What's the reason? Of course, a roadside sign cannot be too much detailed or in the form of a long sentence because the drivers won't stop the cars to read this uh, precaution. They, in a glance, just passing through uh, in the car, would be able to read the bold letters or the prominent letters, which are just a word or a phrase. So that is why uh, there is a rendered brevity to the statement as it is a roadside sign. Now, look at it from the linguist's orientation. Look at it from a linguistic stylistician's point of view. You notice that it is 
an imperative statement imperative statement or a command it is telling us not to do something it is forbidding us from doing something and the most striking thing of this uh, roadside sign or statement is that it is in capital letters to grab the attention of the uh, watchers or the ones who would view it the drivers and we think that there is a letter or a few letters that are missing had it been a statement said by a person or written somewhere else in writing rather than the roadside sign it would have been there is no left turn so the word uh, there and the word is are implied implied they are supposed to be uh, filled in or understood by the reader or by the viewer so this roadside sign no left turn has depicted to us that there are multiple levels at the level of language at the level of linguistics at the level of grammar which would be of a great concern for a linguistic statistician he would observe these uh, elements he would observe these features in order to see why a text is formed in this particular way what are the features that have been employed in this text that it functions accurately or that it functions properly for the sake of communicating the message which had been intended by the creator since it was the roadside sign which is to give the audience a warning that is why the observe the graphology of this text the graphology of the text highlights it in the bold letters then look at the morphology of the text that it is composed of three words in which there is the there is the first word that is the negative word which states that the statement is forbidding us from taking an action it is a warning then we observe that it is grammatically a comparative uh, it is it is grammatically an imperative statement an imperative statement or a command then the implied part that is the missing part which is to be filled on the basis of the readers understanding so the reader fills it in as there is no left turn so this is the um, entertaining exercise of uh, the linguistic practice that how the linguistic stylistics would make you sensitive to language and you would observe language used in advertisement on the billboards or uh, on the uh, slogans that you see on the banners or even in the conversation of uh, the uh, uh, persons that you meet or even in the discourses that happen in television in the form of political talk or in the movies drama so this is the dimension of uh, the language that you can expand it you can expand your analysis on the basis of linguistic analysis where you are sensitive to language you're observing language as minutely as possible because you are dissecting it in two parts this dissection is like that of uh, you know converting a whole into little and many pieces and all these pieces have separate identity like morpheme like graphology lexis semantics when these pieces are combined together they function as a whole like an engine of a car if the engine is functioning as a whole in a car to let it to work properly then the engine contains many significant parts which can be labeled or named or identified separately too so that is what is the purpose of the linguistic stylistics the linguistic stylistics focuses on these elements of language these features of language which are there in the language for its composition as well as for the composition of the meaning inherent and embedded in the texts so this was uh, today's lecture in which we looked at in detail the one of the major forms of stylistics that is linguistic stylistics we will meet for the next lecture again inshallah thank you